Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Rajeshwar Mastery and today I'm excited to have Elaine Poffeld, who's an independent journalist, speaker, who specializes in entrepreneurship and careers. She's the author of the upcoming book, Tiny Business, Big Money, and she was also the author of the book, The Million Dollar One Person Business, which is published in Random House, where she looked at how entrepreneurs are scaling to $1 million in revenue prior to hiring employees. Uh, she was uh, uh, a guest on Lifestyle Mastery on episode number 46. Uh, and Elaine, thank you so much for sharing the copy of your book. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the book and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Rohit. It's great to be back and I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's been a couple of years that, uh, you know, I, I, I had uh, uh, spoken to you last. Now, you know, what, what made you uh, write another book and how did, the, uh, how did you get interested in writing a book about uh, tiny business, big money? It flowed out of the last book, Rohit. It, I um, found that when I was updating the first book, a lot of the businesses said to me, I'm no longer a one-person business. I started adding my first team members and they were struggling a little bit with that because they had all their independence. Some of them are digital nomads. They had the life of a solopreneur and now they had a team. And if they weren't able to communicate what their vision was for the business and what they needed people to do, they would be a bottleneck. And I thought, wow, there really isn't something out there explaining how these businesses on the cutting edge are keeping their independence. Uh, the leaders are keeping their independence while still building up a team. Um, and so that really interested me. And um, it, it was really a lot of fun to find out. I mean, one business doesn't even have meetings. They manage the whole business on Notion or the tech platform. And I thought, this is the future of business. It's not going to be like the business we were trained to enter when we graduated from college. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, uh, you, the point you talked about Notion, uh, it's become one of the most important tools for, for, for remote work. And and just, I think two years back, you know, would have been crazy to talk about remote work, but now uh, it, it's pretty much given in every company that, you know, remote work is going to be there. But, you know, during the pandemic, you know, what, what was the entire process for, for writing a book? Uh, did you have to really concentrate uh, with, with all the, you know, private, uh, you know, life with your, with your kids and all? Um, how did you go about, you know, uh, writing a book then? It was challenging, uh, <laughs> as you might imagine. I have four children. Uh, three girls are, are in their teens, and my son is uh, 11, and they all went to online school. I live in New Jersey, uh, outside of New York City, and we were pretty locked down for a while. And one thing that was a real blessing was my yoga school was open, but they, they took the school outside during the summer, and I met a teacher in the class who... Uh, was an astronomy teacher who traveled from school to school, but now he couldn't do that during the pandemic. So he was tutoring. So with um, some parents in my neighborhood, we formed a pod. I don't know if they call it that in the UK, um, but it was like a little learning group. And he would come a couple of times a week to make sure that the boys really learned something. Because as you know, there's a lot of temptation to play video games when people are on the computer at that age. Um, and so that that helped out a lot. And, um, you know, it was bit by bit, I had to break it up into small portions, because I never had the time that I would have normally had, but I, I finished it, I was a few months late in finishing it, but it got out there. And, uh, <laughs> and here we are. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, just a couple of years back, as I mentioned, you know, it would have been very difficult to work uh, remotely uh, from home and people you were allowed to you know get the work done but not being done but uh, but you know uh, go going back to to small businesses uh, did do you think covid accelerated the growth of small businesses and it's going to accelerate uh, more of these small businesses going there i think so uh, i think it definitely did in the us i know i saw a statistic saying that 5 million small businesses were registered last year and it was um, up from three, um, that I should say million, I, I think I misspoke and said billion, um, up from three million a few years back. It was pr a pretty significant growth. And I know around the world, we've seen the great resignation where yeah. people have really rethought what they want out of life. They've rethought the logistics of their life, whether they want to go into an office or not. Um, and I, I think people are realizing no time like the present 
to do yeah. this, if this is what you want to do. There's also a lot of opportunity now to run a business from home because so much of commerce remains online. And I think one thing that was really interesting was people recaptured some of their time spent commuting when they were home. Like if they finished their work, normally they'd get in the car or get on a bus or a train and go home. And it's very hard to work in those environments. But now they were done, maybe they could go for a walk or exercise. And then in the evening, they can easily work on a business. And what happened was people realized they were good at it. They never had a chance to see if they were any good at it. And they did small tests and they found, hey, you know, I put up a product on Amazon and it sold or, you know, I, I put up a website and I was able to attract people using Facebook advertising. They never would have had that proof that gave them confidence to go further with the businesses. So I think this, in a way, has been one of the unexpected blessings of the pandemic that all these nascent entrepreneurs found out that they can actually do it. Yeah, no, I, I think you made a super point, and I think it's not only relevant in US, but also in UK and Southeast Asia. Uh, there's been a growth of a lot of small businesses, but uh, I wanted to understand what, which are the which are using the most popular small businesses, uh, which would have the most income potential. You know, if you would want to advise to the listeners out there. Well, uh, I'll tell you how I arrived at this, and then I'll get get into the list. Um, what I did was I obtained census data from the US Census Bureau. And I think the industries would be the same worldwide pretty much um, for every industry code in America. Like, um, you know, for instance, uh, business to business e-commerce would have its own code. Consumer e-commerce would have its own code, et cetera. There are thousands of them. And then I, I found out the average revenue, the average payroll, and the average employee size. And I only went up to 20 uh, employees or less because that's a micro business and subtracted the average payroll from the average revenue to see which businesses had the most money left over. It's a rough proxy for profit, but it is not any, it's not exactly profit because payroll is only one cost. It's usually the biggest cost in many employer businesses, but you could have a business in a big city where real estate costs are the highest, right. et cetera. Um, and it was really, and then we sorted it by one to four employees, five okay. to nine employees and 10 to 19. The reason being that to have a, a business with, that needs more employees, you need more capital. So somebody who's like, I really don't have access to a bank loan or anything like that could say, well, I'll start with one of the businesses that's best for zero to four employees. Now, what happened was kind of interesting. My kids said I was chuckling like a lunatic when we got the data because <laughs> in the zero to four employees, the top business that emerged, and maybe this is no surprise to anybody, it was casinos. It was surprising to me because how do you run a casino with less than four people? But it turns out there are these little casinos in gas stations well, in some states. I'm not going to recommend that one. I mean, some people might have that expertise, but it's obviously one that might be a little controversial, but it's out there for people who do want to do it. And the second one was creamery butter. And I found out that butter creameries are heavily automated. So they almost have no payroll. Oh, okay. It was really interesting. So it really unearthed a lot of interesting things. I also found that there were a lot of private equity backed businesses like, um, Medical transportation in the United States, there's a lot of private equity in that. Uh, the reinsurance industry, that's the insurance companies that insure insurance companies. That was a big one. That was the top one in the 10 to 19 employees. Not for everybody, but I know friends who work in that industry. If you're in that industry, you could start a small shop and it's apparently quite profitable. Um, but then I also interviewed almost 60 entrepreneurs who were at a million or more and I looked at what industries they were in too, because I wanted to find industries that the average smart person can do. So not everybody's gonna go out and start a casino. You'd really have to have contacts in that industry. But one of the big ones was business to business e-commerce, which it, it, it came across on several of the different size categories. And one example of that would be a Purva Batra, who was a 29 year old who lives in Texas in uh, the US and 
he sells the plastic bags that come inside of cereal boxes and pharmaceutical products, but he niched down. He only works with small and mid-sized businesses. He went to trade shows and he discovered that the really big companies in those industries have their suppliers and they need such a vast quantity that a very small business couldn't really serve them. But the small and mid-sized businesses, you know, maybe it's like a mom and pop granola business, those needed the bags too. He loves to travel around the world. So he designed the business so they order everything online. And if he's anywhere on the planet, it's all automated. You know, the order is being sent out. It's a beautiful business. It's about 3 million in revenue with just, he was a million dollar one person business. And then he started adding people and he's, I think he's got two or three now. So that's a really hot category. Another one is what I call souped up service businesses. We all, you know, if you're a student of Tim Ferriss and those types of entrepreneurs, trading time for dollars, right? Like you don't want to be doing that. But a yeah. lot of us are in businesses where we perform a service. The key to that is finding added revenue streams. And one example would be Jenna Kutcher, who is a mom and she was working for Target um, and she wanted to be able to work from home. And she had a talent for photography. She became a wedding photographer. And then she started developing courses to teach other people how to take good pictures. And that became an add-on. But she started an Instagram feed where she put up her photos and they're really good. And she would write a little vignette about her family. Usually they were pictures of her beautiful family and her like these really cute children that she has. And she built a huge following, like 800,000 people. Oh. So now she gets advertising revenue from the Instagram. And so all those things in combination are really the business. So she's not take, just taking photos at, at, a, at a, uh, a wedding. I'm not I don't mean just, that's a lot of work and there's an art to it. But the reason she's generating multi-million dollar revenue is that. And I, I think there's a lot of lessons in that wholesaling is another really good one that's um like you could sell to business to business clients but not doing it online um that, and there were a lot of things like um and that crosses over with manufacturing like ethyl alcohol manufacturing i guess ethanol is a really big one um but there's all kinds of different things that people are manufacturing like little widgets for cars and things and they they make one thing that serves a bigger company these are not glamorous businesses these are the millionaire next door who has an unglamorous business but is making really great income from from the business um those are transportation is a good one and you don't have to be flying a plane or something yourself one woman um janine ianarelli sells used private jets it's a commission-based business but think about what a jet costs right like yeah. even if you have a small commission you're you're making a ton of money um that's another one um there's some overlap with some of these categories like an, um with manufacturing jeffrey stern is one of the case studies he's a guy in his 60s and in the us i don't know if they have this in the uk there's a birthday party store in the shopping malls called build a bear workshop uh -huh. and these kids make little teddy bears okay and they have little voice boxes so what he did was he found somebody to make the voice boxes he outsources it and he won this big client so he's bringing in four million dollars a year well. from his business and he doesn't even have any employees now he kind of toggles back and forth between having contractors and having employees, depending on who he's serving. He also added on, there are uh, greeting cards where if you fold it open, there, they, it plays music like Elvis Presley and that sort of thing. And those same little voice boxes that he makes go in those cards. And I mean, the beauty of this was these are people that have like, you know, one employee or, you know, 10 contractors. They have so much flexibility still. But the difference between these and the pure million dollar one person business is it is a small team. And so the minute you have a team, you have to manage it differently. Even I do, like my children work in the business, my teenagers, and actually my older daughters are twins who are great at math and they help me program the spreadsheets for the book um, to do all the math. I have to instruct them on what I 
want, they would not have been able to figure out what data to use or why I wanted it because I'm the author of the book and I knew what I wanted, right? So I have to figure out a way to communicate it with them so that they can then execute on it. And also I can take in their ideas too and make the book better. They thought of a lot of ideas that enhance the chart and better ways of doing things than I ever would. They're very proficient with spreadsheets. So that's the role of the, you, you become a leader, even if you don't really think of yourself as a leader, you feel like a solopreneur, you're really not anymore. And that's what makes this book different is I really got to go into the weeds. Um, one of the things I found is that they go along a continuum in terms of how they actually scale up a little bit. And it goes from automation usually, that's the lowest risk way of getting help, right? Because you don't have to fire an app, you just stop ordering it and paying for it. And, and then it goes up to em employees and partnerships. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Rajesh Srivastava is an entrepreneur who runs Price Series. That's a yeah. company out in California. He worked in big tech and he, he does specialized reports for investors. And he automated a lot of his sales processes for selling the reports. He does something to rank in Google where every day he puts a certain chart that he creates on the homepage of his site because Google rewards fresh content. That's all automated. He doesn't have to do it. He had contractors help him build a few things for the site, but then he no longer needed that contracted help. So it's a pure automated business. And that's that's one end of it. But then usually what happens is people need a person. Maybe they need someone for customer service with a little more of a human touch. And they'll add on, it'll be like automation plus contractors. And then it might go to, okay, I'm using these contractors all the time and they charge $150 an hour and I really need them 40 hours a week. That's, I'm paying them way too much. And maybe they would appreciate more income security. So maybe we can work something out where I pay them a little less per hour, but they get the benefits of being on a company. So then you go to maybe automation plus employees or maybe automation, a few contractors plus employees. Then usually... At a certain point, they, as it grows, they'll, it'll be all, like all maybe tech plus employees and not many contractors anymore. And then finally, you might have a partnership. One, one fellow runs a business called Lawson Hammock, and he was running it himself. He makes these hammocks. And then he had an expertise in real estate. That's what his original field was. And in the pandemic, this was booming. So he wanted to get back into it. So he found a local team that they got equity in the business and they run the back end, but he's still an equity holder. So he gets the benefit of being a business owner, yet he can cash in on this real estate boom for the time being and, or maybe permanently, who knows? Um, so I go into a lot of case studies in the book about exactly what does this look like in real life? Because I find this is where people struggle with human beings, right? Like human beings are messy. They have emotions. Yeah. They, you know, they have different desires. And now that it was the pandemic. So it was, it was very interesting for me because the solutions they were using were not what a corporation would use. They were very yeah. grassroots. They were very inexpensive. Um, and one example, Colin and Angie Raja would document all the processes in the business they scaled up to 20 people they have employees and it's a business they're in new york a lot of the time but um, they're in chennai india also and so they had to make sure that if they were not in india that they could communicate with the team there what they wanted and sometimes they would fly to india to work one-on-one -on -one with people but some of them they really took a lot of pride in creating jobs for women who wanted to work from home so some of them were in their home. So they had to really document this well. And I thought, well, what, like I never document the processes in my business, but now I'm going to, because it saves you so much time if you can give people a video or give them a worksheet and they can now implement it in their own way within certain rules. So to me, that was like, I thought that's the area where these entrepreneurs have so much to teach people about growing the business. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think a lot, lot of interesting points. Uh, uh, looks like e-commerce and physical products, especially when it comes to manufacturing and wholesale, uh, are, are pretty popular when it comes to, you know, building such small businesses. Uh, but you also talked about automating a business. What, what do you think are some of the favorite tools 
or, or what tools would you suggest uh, if if an entrepreneur is looking to automate their business? This is an area that's a little bit industry specific. Um, so I, what I did was in the book, I I documented the um, processes that different entrepreneurs are, are using. I'll, I'll give you an example. Tiffany Williams is one of the entrepreneurs and she was an Amazon seller. And then she started focusing on teaching women how to start businesses. And she had a team of contractors. First, she had her mother as a contractor, and then she started, it grew to about 10, but she also didn't want to hire more people than she can afford. So she, everywhere she could, she used automation. So for instance, what she told me her favorites were Adobe stock for stock photos, Canva, which is a um, graphics program, click funnels for marketing, um, convert kit, which is another email marketing platform, um, Podia for her courses and text 180, um, which is for uh, text messaging, marketing messages. So I really drilled down with a lot of people because I think this is a value of talking with these entrepreneurs. If you get just one of them, right? Say text 180 helps you grow your business exponentially by like $100,000 in one year. That's, I mean, that's incredible value that she shared there. If you didn't know about it yeah. or Podia, I've heard a lot about Podia for courses. It's a modestly priced program, but it's apparently quite robust. And it's uh, a lot of entrepreneurs are using that now. Everybody wants to do a course at some point, right? It seems like that's so hot if you have knowledge and it's in demand. People want that knowledge, um, but you need to find the right platform. So I really grilled them all on their favorite tools and podcasts and you know all the little tricks that they use to amplify what a small team can do. I mean the million dollar one person was to amplify what one person can do. But even when you you know if you have one other person, you still have that same need. You really don't have vast resources and you want to get a lot done. Plus there's a lifestyle component with a lot of these businesses these folks, whatever age they are, they want to enjoy their life. They don't want to just be working 24 seven and like packing every box themselves, you know, hand manufacturing things. They, they want to outsource it. They want to go on a bike ride or do whatever they like to do or whatever they could do during COVID. Um, so that's part of it too, is freeing yourself and your team from all these mundane tasks and really uh, enjoying the creativity of the business freeing time for R&D and innovation and seeing other entrepreneurs, all the things that really stimulate you and make you a better entrepreneur and get much more out of the business, not just in money, but just in the rewards of, of, of self-realization, of, of being your best entrepreneur. Yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, all these tools do help uh, automate your life and your work and it, it frees you up to be more creative uh, in, in your business. Um, you know, I wanted to understand how, how would, uh, how can people find the money to grow? Uh, you know, do you, do you, do you, do you, did you find that most people started off with the savings or credit cards or, uh, you know, crowdfunding or equity, or do you think more, a lot of them did give up equity to, to scale up the business? I just wanted to understand what were your thoughts on this? They pretty much everybody put their own money in, in the beginning, right? Sure. It might not have been a lot, or they invested a lot of their time, which is time is money, basically. Um, and then they would start bringing in other things because who's going to back your business if you don't want to back it yourself? Yeah. It's really, it's very hard to get anyone else behind it. Um, I didn't focus too much on equity backed businesses because that's a whole other world. And usually the businesses at this size don't need it. So we, um, there were people that, use crowdfunding. Um, I'm actually doing a webinar tomorrow um, with Vanessa Jaswani, who they, she and her husband, Kish Basnani, they created Nomad Lane, yeah. which is a travel bag company. And um, they raised $2.1 million on Indiegogo. And what's so incredible about their story was all the legwork they did ahead of time to make sure the crowdfunding was successful because you don't just put it up and it goes crazy. Like you've got to be cultivating relationships with your fans ahead of time. There's a lot of communication strategies that go into it. it you know, you've got to have a good prototype up there. Like who's going to 
pre-ordered the product if the bag looks ugly, right? And the pricing has to be right too. I think they originally had priced it at $100 and they got the advice that if they priced it at $200, it would be more sought after. And that was true. Then they had this thing happen during the pandemic, which was nobody was traveling. So this bag was designed to be a laptop bag to fit under an airplane seat. And so they made the first three months of, of the pandemic year 2020, they made a million dollars. And then basically their revenue fell off a cliff. Oh, okay. And so they, they created a Zoom call. They went, they're very much um, inspired by the crowd that follows them. They created a Zoom call for their fans and they asked them like, what other kind of bags would you want? And they just talked to them and got to know them. And people like the fact that their bags had a lot of pockets inside and kept them organized. So they created a non-travel bag, I guess, you know, a tote bag with the same pockets. And they introduced that and they did a smaller crowdfunding campaign for that. So now the business is, is you know, it's well positioned because people are traveling and now they have this new product too that's fully funded. Um, you know, I love their resourcefulness. They're, they're on the younger side. They didn't have that many years in a career to build up all of their, um, you know, their resources yet. And But you can do other things too, like, spousal income. That's what um, Brian Abrams did. He has a, a it's a, an agency that places project managers in technology and his wife worked and they lived on her earnings and, and he worked too, He but he worked as a contractor doing projects for a while so he could launch the business. They had children, a house and all that stuff. And then it started having cash coming in and he would fund it through cash flow. Um, but there's a whole chapter on on all the different ways that they funded their businesses. Another thing is um, bank funding, which people sometimes overlook at the early stages. But if you have good credit, and you can have good credit, even if you're a few years out of college, um, Shaquille Prasla, what he became is an aggregator. He had one e-commerce business. And then he started getting loans backed by the U.S. Small Business Administration, which for those who are not familiar, it comes through a bank, but this government agency guarantees that if you don't pay it, they will pay back about 85% of it. So the bank doesn't have that much risk. So he was using that kind of funding to acquire a stable of other businesses. And I met him in Texas. He was doing great. Um, you know, he and he was ahead of the curve because now you have all these aggregators buying up Amazon stores. There's probably 50 of them out there right now, all investors who realize these things are very profitable. And if they put them under one roof and they handle all the, the back end of it, they can run it efficiently. Like maybe they have one marketing person doing the marketing for all of those yeah. 12 stores. Um, so that's another avenue to think about because it, it People always think well, they can't get a bank loan, but he he did get it. He also happened to have a finance background, so he ran these businesses in a very organized way. I mean, one tip for anybody listening, keep good books, because a lot of times the financial opportunities that come to a business, people want to see what, you know, can you send your balance sheet? And if you're like, it's going to take me two months to get caught up on all those receipts and everything, then you lose the opportunity. So yeah. that's the number one investment to make is get a good bookkeeper um, or some people are financial pros and, you know, just do it, do it every week, keep it really clean as a whistle um, because it's, I don't like bookkeeping. I outsource it to bench, which is, it's like an AI powered service. There's other competitors to that. That's a blessing because you know, your books are pretty much in order, or if you didn't post certain things, they remind you. And so you never really fall behind. Yeah. No, I think I think that's that's super interesting. I didn't know about the the bank financing thing. I think that's something uh, which li listeners would find it very useful. And uh, you know, when it comes to finance, I, uh, my my follow up question is about uh, what channels to to grow the business. You know, when it comes to marketing, or what 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 are most of the entrepreneurs doing? Is it email marketing or content marketing? Any any thoughts on which which are the primary sources of uh, channels to grow the business? Email marketing was very big. Um, digital marketing, like paid and organic. Um, content marketing is, but content marketing can be a little bit expensive um, because making content is, is expensive, but it's also an investment. If you do it well, you don't necessarily have to do a ton of it. Like if you create a page that's the number one page on something in, 
any search engine, you know, that, that will really help you a lot. There's a lot of social media marketing. What I find is people are picking one and really focusing in on that and really excelling at that. And maybe they have a light presence on the other ones, but they really double down on the one that's working for them. Um, there, you know, there's sort of combinations of this um, in terms of getting proof of concept and using social media. One of the entrepreneurs who's from Australia, Anna Gavia, she was a medical student with $200 to start her business and she liked sketching and uh, she sketched a bikini and she called, she used Alibaba and she found a factory in China that would make one sample of the bikini with her $200. She put it up on Instagram and she saw if women would take pre, make pre-orders and she got about a thousand. So then she went back to the factory and said, I have all these orders. And it was a small run. Usually factories don't want to do those small runs, but they were a young factory too. And they wanted to grow with her. So she used that approach to spread the word. Um, and then she, when she had the proof that people would actually buy it, that was when she made it. So she conserved her startup capital and she was also marketing it. This was the only place she was sharing it. Then she built up a store and it has all these best-selling styles that she's already tested and she just lets go of it if no one likes it, except for her. You know, sometimes that happens. We fall in love with an idea. I'm sorry that I'm moving my computer a little because the light is suddenly it's like shining and making me look like a demon. I'm going to hear I'll turn this way. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, and, and, you know, I think those creative uses are really important because when you are a small business, you don't, you can't waste hundreds of thousands of dollars on something the way a big company can, you'll, you'll deplete all your, your money. Um, another entrepreneur uh, from Toronto, Jason Vandergrant, did something interesting where if he has an idea, he had a bad experience a few years ago. It wasn't a bad experience, but a learning experience. He loves uh, designer sunglasses. And so he designed an app that you could get them for a discount, you know, it'd be like the best places to go, but he didn't really do all the homework that maybe he would have done today. And he didn't realize there was a lot of competition in the space. So he spent 29,000 US dollars and then discovered it wasn't worth it to, to really run it. So he closed it down and he said, never again, his, his business, by the way, is um, it sells CAD designs. It's like a type of engineering design. Right. He has like 40 contractors around the world. So now when he gets an idea, because think about how many entrepreneurs have like eight ideas buzzing around their head at any time, he gets a GoDaddy website and he puts up a drawing of it or a prototype. And then he buys Facebook ads and he drives traffic to the site and he has a mechanism to take order similar to Anna Gavia on Instagram, but it's a website. And if he gets no interest, he just cuts the cord and he doesn't make he doesn't go forward with the idea and he'll move on until he finds one that people like um that's that's one of the things i found is you know if you could get too entranced by an idea and it's not a good product market fit that's where you have a lot of the risk in entrepreneurship you know you like Sometimes you're too early to market. Sometimes you're too late. Sometimes there's some hidden fatal flaw in the business idea that will only dawn on you three years later. But if people are not interested in buying it right now, after you've given it the college try, there's a time where you maybe want to cut your losses and think about one of the other eight ideas that you have, right? And, yeah. and move on. And I think these folks have showed a lot of ideas about risk minimization, because there's, I think there's a myth that entrepreneurs just love taking risks. I don't know that they do. I think they love earning money from great ideas and making a contribution. I don't think they love gambling necessarily as if they were in a Las Vegas casino. Yeah. And, cool. and so that's what I really learned from their mindset is, is they test and it's and like the testing is woven into the marketing strategies. And you can do that with email too. You could offer an opportunity to order something or say like, you know, if we offered this, we're, um, we're, take, we're building a waiting list. That's oh, one yeah. thing I saw people doing. Um, Selena Sue is somebody who does it. She has a, a course, you know, uh, Impacting Millions. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, she's pretty popular. And she takes a waiting list. Yeah, she's hugely successful with it. And she's got it. I think she's got three people people um and 
I, I joined the waiting list just because I was curious about what happens next in the in the chain. And that's the way she measures interest. Right, super interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, COVID had been had been quite an accelerator, but it, it was, uh, it, it it also led people to, to believe that, you know, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties in life. So, uh, you know, do you think most of the entrepreneurs, especially, you know, who are growing the young, uh, the, the small businesses, should they quit their, their job or should they keep the job and work uh, on the side while they're growing the business? What's, what's been your experience when you speak to entrepreneurs? Most people really can't afford to just quit their job, um, but I found it's not really necessary. And actually it gives you runway if you do have a job, as long as you're not under any sort of agreement that you, you, know, you won't work in that industry for any other company or you, you, know, you won't reach out to certain clients. It, it, it's usually okay. It's good to always check those papers that you signed when you took the job to make sure there's nothing in there that will get you fired. But I always think of the example of restaurants Right? We've all had restaurants open in our community where we see it and we're like, oh, that looks really interesting. I think I'll try that. But then you never get around to it for a few months. And then by the time you're ready to do it, the restaurant is gone yeah. because the owner thought everybody was going to come on the first day and they didn't because they everybody was thinking the same way you were like, oh, I'll, you know, a couple of months, I'll try that. And you really, that's why you really need funding for like six months to a year. But when they say the advice of like, save that up, who can do that, right? Like save up six months to a year of living expenses, plus six months to a year of business expenses, you know, with inflation going on in a lot of parts of the world. That's very, very difficult to save that amount of money, especially for someone who's younger and hasn't had that many years to do it, or, or people who have kids in college or whatever. It's hard. So why put that pressure on yourself? Just use your salary. If you have a partner or spouse, maybe, you, you know, you batten down the hatches and use one person's income to pay the bills and then you use the other money to fund the business. Um, I, I don't think quitting is such a good idea. Plus, quitting gives you like when you're in a job, you're able to network, right? You're going to industry yeah. events, you're around your colleagues. And the longer you keep that going, the better because you, you may uh, find a new customer that way or find new ideas. And then at a certain point when you're, you're really getting a lot of business, that's when you will want to leave because you, you really can't manage both and you don't want to be disappointing your employer or disappointing your customers or both at the same time. It's just so stressful. Plus it's not really right to do that. Um, but I think it's a year or two into it where you quit your job, even though people hate their jobs a lot of times and they want to quit. And sometimes they just do quit and they do fine in a perfect world. I would say, keep it for as long as you can. Yeah. I think that's a super advice. And uh, you, you know, what, what do you think, uh, or uh, what do all the tiny businesses have in common? Is there something which you found was common in all the businesses? I think that they're very scrappy. They, um, you know, they they really find very creative ways around obstacles. These are people that you know, they don't let the fact that they're tiny stop them from doing anything. They just find a way to do it at the scale that they are. They don't compare themselves to a business that has. 80 million in venture capital in their coffers. That's not the same type of a business. They do it in a grassroots way using the resources they have available. I also think that they really take stock of their personal resources. Like some, someone might be an introvert and gravitate towards acquiring customers in a digital way because they're just not that comfortable talking to other people. They recognize that and they lean into that strength. Another person might be very friendly and gregarious and they love working the floor at a trade show or something like that so they might go in that direction but they they're just honest with themselves about what their strengths are and maybe they bring in some people to help them in the areas they're not so strong in and that's why the businesses do so well i mean i think where people really struggle with getting to seven figures is someone isn't really that good at certain things, but they won't let someone else do it out of pride or like, I'm going to tackle this. I really want to learn this. But meanwhile, it's slowing down the business and then the business can't reach its potential. And they would be much happier if they did what they were really best at and then, you know, had some collaborators and, and 
benefited from the other people's ideas and energy and it's fun to work with other people too right it's it's a little low i mean some people like someone like me for years it was a one person business but i have a house full of kids i'm around people constantly but if you're just alone in an apartment if you, some people love the solitude but if you're a social person maybe you feel like you know what i really wish there was someone to talk to when i'm working yeah when you have these teams it's fun you know it is this just like an interchange that goes on there that gives you energy yeah you know absolutely uh, you uh, you said you said it right that you know they're scrappy and you know they have uh, that, that, that sort of resilience and uh, you know i wanted to understand for entrepreneurs uh, and, and even otherwise you know people are on to copy jobs how do you how do you become a learning machine because things are changing so fast we never thought a covid would happen but you got to constantly you know adapt to the situations how what 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 are your uh, advice on how to become a learning machine that's a really good point because things were changing so quickly i think human relationships like really prioritizing having that extra conversation a lot of times people feel like they're not really working if they're chatting or like they spend an extra 15 minutes on the call asking about how somebody's dog is or something like that but it's those relationships that when you like suddenly your supply chain falls apart Angie Raja told me what she found was other, she's an um, an e-commerce entrepreneur she's the one who's documenting her processes some of the um e-commerce entrepreneurs are sharing shipping containers well how do you know how to share the shipping container who to share it with it would be by talking to other people in your industry that you already have a trusting relationship with the time to make the relationships isn't when the other shoe drops it's like long before that it, and it's realizing that part of the wellness of your business is really getting to know people in your industry and again people sometimes are introverts that could be on um digital platforms where you never talk on the phone or whatever but you can still build a relationship but just figuring out how do you like to build relationships with people in your field and sometimes other fields too like complementary fields that might do things in a way that you could learn from and then the other thing is figuring out how you like to take in information I know a lot of people like uh what are you learning they listen to podcasts uh newsletters are very hot some people like to just read paper books and mark them up there's not really a right way to do it it's just whatever way you like to do it but um Vern Harnish who uh, founded EO he's one of my clients and a mentor to me he always says leaders are readers and I think even if you're a leader of a team of one other person um taking in that information is really really important youtube also is a gold mine of information there's i mean there's some scammy things going on you know with you know let me sell you my course which leads to another course which leads to an you know and you're driving a maserati in your pajamas and you know earning millions overnight that that kind of thing is silly but there's a lot of really practical and good stuff on there too and you know, being a, a critical consumer of this information you'll you'll quickly see you know what is hype and what is real but you can find out so many things on there i've i've learned a lot of different things for my business by doing that and it's very quick too um you know you could quickly you know for 10 minutes watch a youtube video like what you're doing here right you um you're an informed host you know this whole space so you pick your people that you follow and trust yeah. and then yeah, um they become your your like your college professors after college or after high school if you didn't go to college yeah yeah no absolutely you, you you made it right i think investing to relationships and and speaking to people whom you trust and you have a relations is quite important um elin i quickly want to do the top three what's your favorite business book my favorite business book oh well i i would have to say it is the 4 hour work week i i that book has a uh spot in my heart when i was at fortune small business magazine i was the book editor in addition to other things and i almost never excerpted any business books frankly because a lot of them are really boring they have good information in them but they're not an enjoyable read and i was an english literature major in college and i always feel like books should be fun to read as well as informative you know even non-fiction how to books and i happened to have lunch with his publicist one day and if i remember correctly we bonded 
because we were both pregnant with twins and it was like a hot day and we were griping about that. And I told her I never can find any good business books to excerpt. And finally, like four months later, she's like, I think you have a, I think I have a book that you can excerpt that you're really going to like. And she sent me that book and I did the first excerpt of that book. And I spoke with him and I learned that he is a real entrepreneur. He was in the supplements business yep. and he had learned a lot from that. And what it showed me was he didn't invent automation. He didn't invent contractors. He didn't invent any of those things, but he pulled it together. He's a synthesizer and he packaged it in a way that inspired people, entertained them and made them actually use the methods. And that's what I found when I did the million dollar one person business. I never thought so many of them would have been inspired by Tim Ferriss. I, I have no idea when I interview someone where their influences come from. And I found with this book too, there were a number that were inspired by him. And I don't often see that with business books where people, they talk about specific methods they learned from a book. So I have to say that book was really life-changing for a lot of people who maybe would not have become entrepreneurs or realize you could do it in such a fun way. Um, so, you know, that would have to be my favorite. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, Tim's book, For Our Work, is one of my favorite books as well. And uh, we'll put that in the show notes. And, you know, if you could go back in time when you started working on this book, uh, what is the one thing you would have focused on or done anything differently? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Uh, you know, while why you, you, you were writing the book, uh, you know, is there anything you would have done differently? Well, I probably would have interviewed even more entrepreneurs, but you have a limit in terms of pages because I, I love pattern matching. And the more I, the more stories I have, I, I had about 60 and there's actually a global paper shortage. So there's sort of a limit on how long these books can be now. Mm -hmm. um, I always like to hear more stories and I hope that I'll have a book number three where I can interview even more to see how these trends are evolving because there's a lot of niches that really interested me. Some of them are kind of wonky in the charts and the in the appendices, like some of the different industries and why uh, why they're so profitable uh, because there's so many of them. I, I couldn't possibly look at all of them, but I, you know, hearing the case studies, you understand exactly why they chose these niches, like a Purva Batra, how beautifully that worked out with the B2B e-commerce. When you, it's when you see it in real life that it's so interesting. But I like I love case studies, so I'll be doing them for a long time. Yeah, no, that's pretty interesting. And um, do you have any favorite online tools? Example, uh, Gmail, Slack, Zoom. You know, I, I can't say that I have a favorite in that category. I think there's so many good ones out there. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I, I could name a favorite on that. Uh, no, no, no worries. Uh, uh, Ellen, what is the best way people, people can reach out to you and know more about uh, the book Tiny Business, Big Money? Well, LinkedIn is a good way. Uh, it's under my full name or uh, Facebook or Twitter. All of those are under my full name. Um, so just write to me. It makes me a better journalist to hear what you're thinking about. I do write back. Um, I love getting questions from people so that I can research them for future articles. Um, so write to me anytime. Sure, we'll put that, put that in the show notes. And where, where can we buy uh, uh, the book, Tiny Business, Big Money? It's available around the world on Amazon and Barnes and Noble um, and in, you know, neighborhood bookstores and that sort of thing. Amazon's probably the easiest place to find it. Got it. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes. And then thank you so much for taking our time. It was lovely speaking to you again. And I really okay. enjoyed the conversation with you. Thank you so much. It was great to reconnect. Take care, Rohit.